Monday, 2 o'clock in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which means you're watching Lancaster Connects. That's right. Time for Lancaster Connects. Good to be back. It's been a busy weekend. Busy week here at the store. Thank you for that. Our wonderful gardeners, Mattress and More customers, where we broadcast Lancaster Connects from. Uh, it is spring. It's spring in Lancaster, which means a lot of changes, a lot of cleaning, a lot of events, a lot of things. And one of the things that we have going on is our spring cleaning. So I lost count, Ben. I tracked it about we have one hundred and thirty eight thousand six hundred seventy five dollars, and that's when I stopped. And one hundred and thirty eight thousand six hundred seventy six dollars worth of inventory. Um, uh, I'm like, okay, I just can't take it anymore. And that's a good enough number to put out there <laughs> and promote. That shows we have a lot and we want to sell it for a little. And so you get at least half off uh, all those mattresses. So that means we're sacrificing about 70 grand or more uh, in uh, in an opportunity, I guess you could say. But uh, every one of those mattresses tells a story of making a customer happy, bringing something in that didn't quite work. It's a floor model. It's a demo. It's got a little scuff. But it could be yours to love and enjoy at home. And so... Our spring cleaning sale has kicked off in full force. And it should be uh, two two points to make there. The reason for the discount, like you said, scuff, damage, whatnot, the product is perfectly fine. As durable as any brand new mattress that anybody else purchases here. It's cosmetic stuff. You know, floor models aren't perfect, for example, or a mattress might have gotten a little scuff coming off a truck. Yeah. Physically, the mattresses are perfectly fine to sleep on. Then the other point, 50% off is a great deal. It's not the fake 50% off. Oh, it's a real deal 50. Yeah. It's a real deal 50. So you'll see a lot of 50% advertising in our industry. A lot of our competitors and chain stores do 50% off marketing, but all they're doing is taking a fake inflated price and calling it half off, right? Yeah. This is not that at all. All the products have our prices on them or everyday low prices and it's yeah. 50% off of that figure. So in, in some cases, it's legit like, well below our cost. We've got a uh, <laughs> we've got a handwritten testimonial to that effect yep. about our pricing and how at the time I could say it now because they're long out of business. But one of our customers worked at the time at Wolf Furniture, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and our pricing was more competitive and more value driven than the pricing there, but more so for the employee, right? Which was just really wild. Right. Um, and so anyway. Uh, not to knock wool furniture, but we've, we've, we literally have that testimonial over in our one of many binders where we get such things. Um, and uh, it's over there somewhere. But, uh, but yes, we have a great event going on. So look, if it's, you know, if it's time to invest in something new for yourself, great opportunity. Really, those the guest beds, it's a great opportunity there. If you get, need something for your kid, we have things there as well. So, uh, feel free to reach us, uh, call us, text us. Uh, you can call and text us at 717-299-6228 and let us know what you need. We'll let you know if we have it, see if it's a fit. Look at us with the texting. That's right. It's like, uh, like us, yeah, it's uh, 2024. <laughs> we're, we're here. That's right. That's right. We're here. So <laughs> we've got a good show this week. It's uh, I didn't know this, but until we prepared for our show, but Wednesday, is that right? No, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tuesday. Tuesday. Got my dates messed up. It's uh, National Agriculture Day. Did not know that. Pretty may big day here in the region uh, where we still grow a lot of things and produce a lot of things. And so we're happy to have our guest on. Um, I guess it's time to bring Jason on. But let's bring him on. That's right. We, we always say we like to try to cut the banter to six minutes we or less. And we, it, yeah, and we yeah, just it's did pretty it. good. We, we went on football what, clock, about what clock were you looking at? Oh, this one down here. <laughs> That's right up there in red. Uh, well, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> Jason, welcome to the show. Jason Stone, uh, owner, Jeff, ben. farmer. What do you call yourself over there at the Productive Peasant Farm? What is the what is the official title? Uh, if I want to sound fancy, I'm the uh, executive director of farm operations and sales. Uh, uh, if I'm yeah, talking to anybody face to face, I'm the owner and farmer guy. Yeah, yep. very good. Yep. Yeah. Very good. So, so thanks for having me on. It's it's great to be here. Yeah. So every day you got your hands down in it. Just about. We're just getting started for this season. Uh just got some peas in the ground a couple of days ago. So we're getting Ooh. back at it slowly but surely. It'll ramp up real quick. So. Yeah. I you know, so I drive an old 
classic. Like it's classic now. It kind of sounds silly. To, still sounds silly to say it. I drove a '96 F250 crew cab truck diesel, and um, I use that to tow our camp trailer and 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 everything. But uh, this weather is pretty tricky right now because I had it on a block heater where you plug it in, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, d- diesel trucks are the original plug-in car. I like to kind of joke, <laughs> um, but. Uh, I, I hid that away last week because we were in this glorious weather of 70. 75, 70, yeah. Mm-hmm. So what's it like right now? This time of year, balancing in Pennsylvania, this up and down. What's that do to what you plan and what you put in the ground? Well, um, yeah, every most every farmer would like to get their stuff in as early as possible so that they have something to sell as quickly as possible. And so you're mm-hmm. always trying to read the weather and... You know, you might look at a seven or 10 day forecast and, you know, see what's coming up and say, okay, if, you know, if it's going to be like this, maybe now's the time to go. Um, and then, you know, you can have a, a stretch like we've had recently over the last two and a half weeks where, you know, it was nice and warm and uh, might have seemed like a perfect time to, to get going. And then all of a sudden you get this cold snap. And um, most years, uh, I would have. Uh, put a bunch of stuff out by now, like salad greens and stuff. We have a few kind of DIY high tunnels um, that, you know, they get the job done uh, in terms of keeping things warmer, um, even in cooler temperatures. Like if it gets down to about 27, 28, I can still generally keep like salad greens and stuff like that going. Um, but as luck would have it, like we just had our first child a couple months ago. We had a little girl and, um, you know, that adds a whole new, uh, dynamic to, uh, managing your time. And so this year I didn't actually get to putting things in when I would have, or, you know, I, I normally have a rough plan to start around March 5th, um, in those tunnels and it just didn't get done. And I was kind of kicking myself, uh, you know, during those warm days, kind of thinking, man, I should be out there and I should get that stuff in the ground. And, um, you know, looking at it now, it's like, had I done that, they, everything would have been germinating right at the point as we're going to get this next snap. And so I kind of lucked out by just kind of holding uh, off. Um, on our farm, it's not too big a deal of something like that. If, if I had planted and, and, and things got hurt by a cold snap, it wouldn't have, you know, it would have just meant that you know, I went through some seeds that, you know, didn't come up to anything, but, um, that's kind of smaller potatoes in the long run. So we would have just started over, you know, (laughs) so we would have started over and just said, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll have something to sell two weeks later than we hoped, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, we had your, uh, little daughter on the screen, Clara, I believe I saw her name is, so. Yes. I love, yep, love the little clothing, little sprout. I love that. That's cute. Yeah. <laughs> she's all, she's got all sorts of veggie and fruit themed clothing that family and friends bought for her. She's got a couple that have pictures of carrots and beets and it says, I love my roots. Uh, no. <laughs> and she's got, you know, she's got summer hats with cherries and strawberries and onesies with, you know, grape vines and, uh, yeah. All sorts of cute stuff. So, yeah, that's cool. So, I, hopefully, that you know portends uh, well for the future, and she'll decide that she'd like to help out at some point. I made a joke to my wife before she was born and said, "You know, as soon as she can grasp my finger, I'm going to have her out there picking cherry tomatoes." Yep. And um, you know, within five minutes, she was on the bed, and I went over to her, and she grabbed right a hold of my finger, and I thought, "Oh." <laughs> I don't know if she's quite ready yet, but get her, get her outside. Yeah. 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 You know, just, just so you know, I appreciate the use of the vocabulary term portend. Proper use of portend. Proper use of. Ben, <laughs> ben attempted that a few weeks back. That's, and so it, that's it's, a, the, it's, it's the second time it's been used here on the show in the last month. And but first time properly. Appreciate the proper use. Cause <laughs> every, yeah. Every now and then I like to throw in like a $16 word. Yep. Yeah, my, my version lost us money, I think. And indicate <laughs> signify. That's I don't believe that. <laughs> that's not how I used it. I don't that remember all, what it was. I'm sure not, Chris can yeah. find it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jason, I want to go back to uh National right. Agriculture Day. That's tomorrow, I think we we determined. Yeah. Um 
what's what what does that mean and and what are your first memories of agriculture or working on a farm or being involved in growing produce yeah um well what does it mean uh hopefully um you know it's a day for everyone because no one i don't think lives on meat alone um i think you end up with scurvy if you do something like that um but, uh, well, I guess there's the carnivores diet. I don't know. But most of us do eat vegetables in some form or another. Um, and other, and fruits and all sorts mm -hmm. of other. I mean, even uh, if you love it, and steak, you still need rosemary to like, you know, flavor it up and right, right. pan. Right? Like, and, still and need that's, that. And, and hey, I mean, you know, raising livestock is agriculture too, right? I have my yeah. produce by them in like my little produce bubble, but. Um, you know, hopefully it's a day for folks to, to just take a second and um, maybe reflect on the, the hard work that's going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, you know, we, we have in a way, you know, a lot of advantage in our contemporary lifestyles where we can go to stores and throughout the year, you know, you can always depend on there being bell peppers there, or, you know, this, that, and the yeah. other at the grocery store. And um, so it can you know, it can make it look like the stuff just kind of appears, you know, and, and sure. it's just, it's just there and it's always available. And, you know, um, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes and, um, over time as our society has kind of moved away from self-sufficiency and having home gardens for a lot of people, um, the kind of the knowledge and understanding of what's going on behind those scenes is, uh, is reduced. So, Hopefully it's a, it's a day where folks can, you know, take a couple seconds and just, um, you know, recognize and hopefully have some appreciation for all the hard work and passion that's going into this all over the country and all over the world. Um, and then your second question was, oh, growing up, how did, what was my exposure to agriculture? Yeah. And, and uh, kind of tying into National Agriculture Day, your, your appreciation for growing crops. Yeah. So, um, I was exposed. To, I grew up in a very rural area in upstate New York, tiny little town mm. called Victory. Um, we had two mechanics and one flashing red light in our town. I mean, if you, <clears throat> my mom liked to say, you know, if you blinked as you were driving through it, you'd miss it. Um, and it was mostly a corn and soybean area. And, that never really struck a chord with me. I mean, we had some farm stands um, spread out here and there. Um, we had a very small garden in the summertime, but it it just never grabbed my attention that much growing up, oddly enough. And then um, I had gone off to college and wanted to be a professor. Uh, by my sophomore year, I I was majoring in political science, and I thought, oh, I want to I want to do this for a living. You know, I want to teach, and I had some really great uh, professors that, you know, really kind of took me under their wing. And, and uh, I really got passionate about that. And so I decided I was going to go on and get a PhD. And um, halfway through the PhD process, uh, I just kind of went through this big change in terms of my outlook on life and what I wanted to do with it. And um, I had my first exposure to a farmer's market. I was in Bloomington, Indiana. And um, there was just this beautiful outdoor market. And I saw some of these farmers who were selling things I had never even heard of before or seen before, you know, um, these really beautiful things that were just fresh. And, um, I just kind of started getting interested in it, you know, and I went and visited a couple farms and, uh, you know, I was going back and forth. I'm like, do I finish this degree? Do I not? Is it? even realistic to jump out of this and go try to go into farming. I, I, I've never heard someone say that's the ticket to financial ease. Um, but over time it just grew and grew. And by the time I finished the degree, I realized I, I really didn't want to, to do that for the rest of my life. And so, um, I came back to Lancaster. We had moved out here a couple of years before I finished the degree. And then, um, I went back at the very end to finish up what I was doing and then came back here. And I just made this decision that I was going to get a job, even if it was part-time a few nights a week or something on a local farm and see if there was really something there for me. 
Um, cause I also knew a lot of people can kind of romanticize farming. And then, you know, once, once you start getting those back aches, it's like, ah, you know, maybe this, <laughs> you know, there's, this isn't all rainbows. Um, but I just, I took right to it. And, um, so I took a few years just to kind of get some more experience and do some more planning and, and then, uh, just jumped right into it. So, um, you know, my appreciation for growing, I don't know. I, I really have a lot of respect for those who put, um, everything they have into this work and who show up to market really having crafted like a really beautiful kind of display to, to just kind of show like, it's not just like celery and potatoes, you know what I mean? Like we, there's just this wild diversity of really delicious stuff. Mm. And unfortunately, a, a lot of that stuff is not in your typical grocery store. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I always do my little test when I go to a supermarket every now and then I just go over and I rip a little beef of parsley off and, and, and it never tastes like anything, you know? And, and I, it's like, mm. all right, well, you know, um, and so are you, are you, are you reporting here on Lancaster Connects live for the first time that our food may be not as healthy as it could be? Is that what we're saying? <laughs> and that I, I may be saying that. I'm certainly <laughs> saying uh, it may not be as flavorful as it, as it should be. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, I so, never considered that. Yeah. And I grew I mean, up on farms, but I never yeah, considered that. You know, it's uh, the, the flavor profile can, can, can deplete pretty quick. But the other thing is a lot of the uh, produce that's grown in supermarkets. Um, and I, I don't, I don't want to like get into like bashing, like big farming or something like, like farming is, is too difficult uh, a profession as it is, I think to, to be like locking ourselves in little clicks and corners and mm -hmm. pointing our fingers at each other and saying, well, you shouldn't do that. And then they point back and say, you're an egghead. Um, it, like if you're selling big volumes wholesale, you're selling it by weight. So you want your truck to weigh as much as it possibly can. And you want to produce as much as you possibly can per plant. Um, as it works out, typically speaking, the varieties that produce the most or produce the quickest or hold up the best are not the most flavorful. And so you have this trade off. And so... Uh, and then there's also other practices like most tomato growers that are shipping nationwide have to pick their tomatoes early because if they're nice and ripe and soft, they're not going to survive the trip. And right. so they're picked early and green. And and then in the trucks, they have like a kind of gas that oftentimes will mm. ripen those tomatoes on the road so that mm. by the time they hit the shelf, they're nice and red. But when you cut into them, there's... There's no juice and there's a lot of times there's no flavor. Uh, you, you know, it's like I recently was talking to my dad and he's like, I got a tomato from the store and I might as well have eaten the sole off the bottom of my shoe. Um, you know, and, and I mean, I knew, I knew, yeah, I knew in the example of green tomatoes, like I knew, I knew you picked them and green and then they would ripen, but I didn't know about the gas part. I didn't know about that. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if that's what every company does, but yeah, it's kind of like, so there's a trick. If you buy an avocado that is is not ripe, you can put it in a little brown paper bag with a banana and the peel gives off a natural gas that helps to ripen mm. it faster. Mm. And so it's whatever that like natural gas is, they, they have the, these trucks that they, they can like pump that into, into the actual trailer while the tomatoes are being transported. And so they'll, they'll get red. Uh, they'll soften up a bit. Um, but when you speed things up like that, mm -hmm. it's just the, the flavor yeah. profile just doesn't really develop. And a lot of times, the most flavorful varieties just don't produce as much. Um, so, so, so what I've learned so far, I mean, if you're, if you're a kind of an at-home chef and you fancy yourself to like enjoy making dishes with fresh ingredients, but you've largely just gotten those from the supermarket, the challenge might be go to a farmer's stand, maybe where you take your goods or mm -hmm. your goods arrive at. Mm -hmm. And if not for anything, just switch out item for item. And yeah. you're probably going to have a more flavorful dish is what I'm gathering. Almost guaranteed. Almost yeah. guaranteed. 
Um, now there are uh, smaller stands that you know they they might grow some of the same types of varieties uh, that aren't necessarily the most flavorful, but <clears throat> almost guaranteed because they're almost certainly going to be fresher. They'll taste better um, if they're if they're picked just you know shortly before you buy them. Um, okay. And yeah, I mean, it, that was the experience I had. I mean, um, I didn't get into cooking with a whole lot of like fresh picked produce until I was at Indiana and I was, you know, 28 years old or something like that. And it was just kind of like this eye opening experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's worth, it's worth an experiment, you know, just to, you know, just to give it a shot, take a, a meal that you typically make fairly often and you really love and you know what to expect from it. And then go get all the ingredients from your local farmer, including, uh, you know, including the protein, if, if it's a meat dish or something like that and, and see what difference it makes. Yeah. Uh, you might just be hooked right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to get, I want to ask you a question about uh, the start of productive peasant farm because it's recent but yeah. on that note of local protein you know ben and i here at the store we once a year get a whole beef cow mm-hmm. i always find it funny that i quantify it as a beef cow what other cow would it be but i feel if i say <laughs> we get a cow sometimes people think like we just park it out back and it eats the grass out back in the and store then, and you milk it yeah right i think if i say <laughs> beef cow it, it, it kind of it it kind of in, in, infers that uh or portends, portends? it signifies portends. it signifies <laughs> that we're getting a cow that's been slaughtered and and portioned out um yeah but yeah local millersville grown uh mm-hmm. right millersville yeah yeah, yeah. Yep, definitely. Miller, millersville grown local mm-hmm. beef and uh boy the difference in flavor is just incredible plus that there's no chemicals and mm-hmm. uh, they don't use hormones and i believe that's part of your uh philosophy as well or way to grow too at productive peasants so share with us that this is i mean fairly recent uh coming up out of the ground and and how you grow and why you grow what you do okay um yeah so i started the farm in 2021 uh finally got it off the ground and it was uh i a friend of mine uh was kind enough he had some spare land so he let me get started it was a little over a half acre and um, I think I started growing like 15 or 20 different crops um, and was selling them almost entirely wholesale to other farmers market vendors. The the person that owned the land, he had a stand, still does have a stand at the West Shore Market. Um, so he actually bought a lot of uh, what I was growing. And then a couple vendors at the Lancaster Central Market, uh, Lemon Street Market, and I had a couple specialty items that went to like the horse and restaurant. Mm. Um, and then I had a small CSA program, um, like 10 families, uh, signed up and I limited it to 10. And then every week for, I think it was about 12 weeks, they got a box of fresh produce, um, uh, from like May 15th to August 15th or something like that. Um, so that's that's how it got off the ground. Um and yeah, I I was really intrigued by this idea that you could work on a really small scale with relatively low financial input. Um because I I came into this I didn't have uh any money to put towards it basically. Um fortunately I like that I, phrase low financial input. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, um that's another great way to say I started pretty lean. Yeah. Yeah, I started very lean. Um, th- there's a couple uh, farmers out there that started getting kind of big on like their YouTube channels and making names for themselves in like 2015 ish. So, or right around the time I was getting really interested, uh, one guy was uh, Jean Martin Fortier up in Quebec, and another guy was Curtis Stone, also up in Canada. Um, he was on the uh, in BC on the West Coast. Um, and they were sharing a lot of information about how basically you could go, you could like Curtis Stone was taking a quarter acre or a third of an acre and grossing like a hundred thousand dollars a year. And they started his business oh, wow. on like, I think he started the business seven years prior. I mean, he didn't make that much money right off the bat, but his, right. his whole operation started 
uh, he said with $7,000 and he just DIY'd and, and bootstrapped his way into a very successful business. Uh, Jean Martin Fortier kind of made his name by showing, uh, how a whole system basically could, if you had an acre or so of land, you could gross about a hundred thousand dollars. Um, the differences between the two were that Curtis Stone was exclusively growing a very small number of very high value crops that were high dollars. So he could generate that kind of revenue on an even smaller scale. Jean Martin Fortier's approach is more like mine, where it's like a whole wide variety trying to be as much of a one stop produce shop as you, as you could reasonably be on a small piece of land. And so I was really like, I mean, partly out of necessity, but partly out of realizing it was like, okay, I don't need to go buy a 20 acre field or um, I don't need to feel bad that I don't come from a family that owns a bunch of land that I can use. Um, I don't have to worry that I'm going into this without too much experience and, and, and employees to help me if we can stay on a small scale and everything is right there. Um, you know, it's, it just seems very doable. And, um, I like the idea of, of not using chemicals. I don't know. I mean, the, the, the research goes either way in terms of like, is it harmful for you to consume it or not? Uh, I mean, and, and I don't know that part of it's just because the inherent difficulties of like doing a nutrition study, like to, mm -hmm. to, to basically make a definitive case, you'd have to get like 2000 people to eat the exact same diet for at least a year. One mm -hmm. of them, it would have to be, uh, like conventional and one would have to be all chemical free. And I don't know how much money you'd have to pay 2000 people mm -hmm. to control their diet for an entire year, but it would probably be a lot. And they'd all have to have like the same baseline of health and just all the, I mean, it, it would be almost impossible to, to really nail that down. But I thought, you know, I'd rather be on the safe side as one. Uh, and the other thing is one thing that was really sh well shown by uh, some research the USDA has done is that um, farmers who use chemicals uh, are, are like, there's a, a statistically significant correlation between farmers who use chemicals and their family members uh, coming down with things like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma mm. and other mm. health problems. So even though in that study, they didn't find a difference between eating organic or eating conventional, the people that were out there doing work um, were, were having much higher instant incidences of, of health issues. And so it's like, well, that's enough for me too. You know, I mean, cause no, you can put whatever guidelines you want to on a, on a bottle of pesticide and say, you have to put on this, this suit and these gloves. And it's like, find me a farmer who has the time to do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, I, right. I don't know. Yeah. A, I don't know a single farmer that's putting on a bio hazard mm -hmm. suit and then jumping out in the field. Um, and you know, they, they were a bit worried that be, when they saw it in the family members too, they said, well, it, it could be drifting. I don't put a lot of stock in that because most farmers that would spray, whether it's chemical or not, you're not going to go do it when the wind is blowing and blowing your stuff all over the place because then you're just wasting your time and your right. money. Yeah, you're wasting um, product. Yep. Right. And so what um, one, you know, idea they had was it might be that, you know, the farmers are just bringing it into the house on their clothes. And it's, it's going in the wash. Maybe they're not doing the laundry. Maybe somebody else in the house is, is handling these things or it's, you know, it's all getting lumped together in the laundry bin or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just thought, you know, I, I guess I'd rather just be safe than sorry. Um, I don't want to find out 20 years from now that something I've been using is, is causing people a problem. You know, that, that right. happened yeah. with uh, something called Thionex and Thiod thiadine or thiadin or something. Mm. And, um, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, flea beetles at all. They're uh, like a farmer's worst nightmare. They, they come out as soon as it hits about 70, 65, 70 degrees mm. and they don't go away until like October and mm. they just eat, eat little holes and a whole slew of, of crops. And, um, it, they're really difficult to deal with, Re like, especially, uh, organically. Um, 
there there was this wonderful chemical that just took care of it like that. Um, and it was fairly cheap. And then, you know, I, I, I don't know how many years it was on the market, but then by, I think it was like 2005 or something like that. Like there was like this global ban on it mm. uh, because they had, they had found through research that the, the toxins were accumulating in mice's systems uh, faster than they were able to get rid of it either through urinating or sweating or just naturally mm. metabolizing it. And so they thought, you know, the mice's genomes are similar enough to humans that, uh, you know, this could be a huge problem for people. And I just thought, I, I don't want to be 20 yeah, years from now signing out. I was, I was, you know, causing that even if it was, you know, best faith, good faith, you know, right. uh, practices. So, um, so that's why I went chem free. And then I, I also had a really, uh, I think it's really important to improve the land that you're on, uh, not deplete it and leave it better for the next person if there's going to be a next person. And so I don't till up the beds that we grow in. We use a lot of compost to try to build up the organic matter in the soil uh, so that the soil itself is healthier um, over time. That should translate into more nutrients in the in the soil for the crop itself. Um, we also use uh, customized fertilizer blends for every crop that we grow. So I have a fertilizer supplier. He probably hates me by now, but, um, it's, you know, instead of calling him and saying, Hey, I need a uh, fertilizer for a hundred acre cornfield. I call him and I say, okay, I need, I have 900 square feet of carrots, 1500 square feet of arugula, you know, all the way down the list. And we grow about 40 different crops. And he makes me these small batches that are for each crop. And wow. he can look at our, he can look at our soil test and say, okay, you're, deficient in this, this, then this. So we need to make sure that's made up for in the blend. And then that way, when I go out into the field, I can, you know, I can, I can go home at the end of the day and say, I have done everything I possibly can to make sure I'm, I'm growing a healthy product for whoever ends up consuming this, whether it's a CSA member that I'm dropping the box off at their doorstep, or it's, you know, a customer going to like Luca and going out to restaurant or the John Wright restaurant where, you know, people expect to have a good meal. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have to, yeah, I, I know I put in my effort. Yeah. yeah that's so. so wild. So even down to the fertile, I mean, you know, you think about people that spend a lot of time on the, the chemical makeup of their bodies, you know, hormones, which actually that's my sleep better tip later in the show. Um, you know, we understand the composition of ourselves, but, and we understand the composition of the food we eat, but do we understand the composition of where our food is grown? That's really interesting. Of the, of the soil it, itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, I knew, I, I was, so I grew up in Canada and, and I know um, you brought up like, you know, being exposed to cancers. As you said that, I'm like, there was a high amount of people that I know that had cancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, th- and this was flat, flat big factory farms, um, Mm -hmm. massive farms. And, uh, you know, the soil was always a problem. And and there, the answer was there, well, we grow this here this year, and then we move it over here the next year, and we bring this other thing in. And ultimately, that just keeps it fertile as best could be. Mm -hmm. But they weren't Mm -hmm. working a nine, they weren't taking this part to 900 square feet like you are with the fertilizer. That's really interesting. Well, that's why I say my, my fertilizer guy must hate me because like I get, you know, with each bag I get, there's like a, a sheet that lists like the ingredients. And at the top, it says like acres and he's got to write like 0.013 or something. (laughs) He's down down doing all this math to, to figure out like how to, how to come up with such small little batches for me. But um, God bless him. I mean, he does it. I really appreciate it. That's cool. Jason, I have a number of questions here. First, first the, the bearded guy that we've been seeing in the photos, is he an employee? The bearded guy is me. I'm just oh, clean the bearded shaven guy is right you. Now. Okay. All right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I get it. Uh, do you have any employees? I, I knew that was him. Do you have um, any employees? Uh, not this year. Um, I For the last two years, I did have uh, a great help. Um, and then uh, towards the end of last year, he ended up getting... Uh, a job uh, with a local school to be a teacher. It was, it was really interesting because he, so the LNP had done a story on, on our farm 
back in its first year. And kind of like the, you know, the plug was like the peasant with the PhD, you know, and it was kind of like, what a weird journey kind of thing. Um, yeah. And uh, so when I moved to Wrightsville, our, the farm size doubled and I saw, you know, it was getting to be spring and I was like, I got to find some help somewhere, you know? And um, out of the blue, I got this email from a guy and he had just finished his PhD in geology, but he wasn't sure that he wanted to go into academics and he really liked growing stuff. And he had come across the article in the LMP. Your doppelganger. And sounds familiar. He, he, yeah. And he said, is, is there, you know, can we talk about like how you made that transition, you know? And so he came out to the farm and we walked around and talked for like an hour and I could tell he was into it. So I just, do you want a job? You know, <laughs> and it was awesome. you know, like that. Um, and he worked there for two years and and had a great time, but he ended up, he did want to like try out teaching and, you know, the kind of bummer about a lot of folks in agriculture is that we don't make enough to provide like health benefits and things like mm-hmm. that. And so, yeah. you know, uh, it made sense for yeah. him to, to go somewhere where he, where he could get those things. Um, so I was grateful for his time this year um, because we just had our daughter and I need to spend more time at home with her. Uh, mm-hmm. My wife works outside of the house and she'll be going back relatively soon. Um, I needed to kind of scale down and just, mm-hmm. so we're, 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 we still have the whole acre. It'll probably end up being like two thirds to three quarters of an acre. Um, and then I've, I've dropped like the, the farmer's markets and things like that. And I'm just going to be doing like uh, home delivery and, selling to restaurants and, and then the CSA program, which people can still sign up for over the next two weeks. Um, Cause that just cuts. Uh, we were spending 30 hours a week. I was spending mm-hmm. 30 hours a week just at the farmer's market yep. last year from Thursday, Friday, or excuse, yeah, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Uh, and it was like, okay, okay. You know, that's, that's gotta go. Uh, so it just, we're, kind of tightening up and, and trying to make things a little more efficient and manageable for, for me to do in the hours, you know, the reduced That's hours. Cool. And that, that was, that was the other question I wanted to ask. Um, you know, so you, you did the farmer's markets and you're not going to continue that this year, but I'm curious about the food delivery. That's cool. Yeah. And also the yeah. CSA, I know you said you had 10 people initially. Has that program gone, a uh, grown? Uh, are you accepting people to buy into the CSA and maybe for those who don't know what a CSA is, maybe explain a little bit about what that what that is. Yeah, so um, kind of it loops back into the first uh, thing we were talking about at the top of the interview. Um, uh, farmers don't have much money in the spring because we don't have much to sell. All of our costs come in the spring. So we have seeds, plants, mm-hmm. any repair, any supplies that need to be replaced. Um, you know, your first quarter taxes are still due. Um, you know, and, and all sorts of, uh, expenses are right up front. And, you know, like for us, for instance, we don't make our first sales until about late April. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like, okay, well, how do you, how do you navigate that challenge? And there's these community supported agriculture programs, um, that have become wildly popular where essentially, uh, kind of usually like January to March, people can sign up and they, they sign up for, to, to get a box of produce delivered to their house every week during the farming season, but they're paying in advance. Mm-hmm. So let's say I'm just spitballing. Uh, the customer gives us $300 for a, a 10 week program or whatever it is. We get that money in January, February, March when we really need it. Mm-hmm. And then to, show our appreciation for that, we give them more than $300 worth of produce over the 10 weeks that they get those boxes. Or at least that's the aim. Now, the programs come in different varieties and and some just would give you the strict $300. Some would give you way more. Some give you a little bit more. Um, so they, they come in all sorts of different colors, but, um, so yeah, that's, that's still going on. It has grown last year. We had 25 families. Mm. Um, so that was really nice. And, um, yeah, there's two weeks left to, to sign up for that. Just go to our website at, um, there's a, in the store, uh, we, we have options. You can sign up for eight, 12 or 15 weeks. 
You can add on some fruit each week if you'd like to. We buy certified organic fruit to include. And then our boxes are actually built around a set of recipes. Um, so you don't just get oh, this cool. like totally random assortment that you... The, the biggest complaints we heard about or I heard about with CSAs before I started mine was we get way too much kale and squash and we don't know what to do with the stuff. Um, yeah. So my customers get kale one week. So they get squash one or two weeks. Um, and we get, we kind of basically have a set of recipes. I, I look around in the field and I say, okay, next week, fennel and beets are going to be ready. And we've got some arugula. Okay, and I'll go and I'll start either searching for recipes that are new or I'll take some that I'm familiar with. That's and then cool. we build the box around like three recipes for the week. Um, and then if, if there's an item that goes in those, uh, like a produce item that goes in those recipes that I don't grow, I'll buy it from another local farmer who does grow it. Um, and then send out those recipes a couple days in advance. It lets you know what's coming in the box, the recipes, and then what you would need to go buy at the store uh, if you wanted to make those recipes. So if the recipe wow. calls for like oil, meat, cheese, something like that, spices, uh, you can go out and get those things and then make those. But at the at the same time, like the boxes are like what you get is flexible enough where you, you're never like, you don't have to make the recipes. It's just if you want some ideas, yeah. but you can play around with it to your heart's content. Um, Great idea. Yeah, so that's that's the CSA, and then we do home delivery um, every week, except for next week because we're I'm on vacation, going up to bring our daughter to meet her grandparents finally. Um, but uh, yeah, we have an online store, um, and you can go to that, and uh, everything we have available for a week. It's it's not going to show right now because we uh, took all the items off, so people didn't start ordering for next week. Uh, but later next week the store will be repopulated with all of the items that we sell. Um, and then as long as we get the order by uh, Sunday night um, and you're within a certain set of zip codes that we deliver to, um, you'll get the produce brought right to your door either really? on uh, a Wednesday evening or a Friday evening, depending on which zip code you're in. Uh, and that runs all year. Um, yeah. And then, cool. we, and then we do some restaurant sales as well. So. And the, the, the CSA box, you mail those as, out as well? Ship those out? Uh, we deliver them right to the door. Or de- deliver, yeah. yeah that, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. So okay, like wow. either Wednesday or, fr- Wednesday or Friday evening. Um, try to do it in the evening so that it's not the hottest part of the day in case you're yeah. you're you're out of the house at work or something. Right. You don't come home to like a bags of melted salad. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we just go straight to your door and Drop off a box. That's and, cool, and that's it. Yeah, we so, were part of a CSA down in um, Millersville, the the Goodwill Farm. I'm sure you're familiar with the Goodwill Farm down there. I, I and have heard. Um, we we lived right around the corner from it years ago, but now we're like half an hour away, and we'd love to be part of it again, but we have to go get it. And mm-hmm. Millersville, a great community to visit, but it's inconvenient <laughs> being half an hour right. away. So that's cool. Yeah. That you offer the service to drop it off because I'm sure there's a ton of people like us who would want to be part of a CSA, but can't for logistic purposes. I'm sure there's even more than a ton of people that don't know things like this well, exist. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it has become more and more common with small farms just for the, for the simple reason that, you know, it's, you've got that kind of cash crunch a lot of the times yeah. in, in the winter months. Um, and, you know, unfortunately like some, some farmers kind of make it harder for those of us who want to do this because, yeah, I mentioned some people say, I, I get too much kale and too much squash, you know, and it, unfortunately, some farmers kind of use it as a way to offload whatever they're overproducing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that, that it was a pretty frequent complaint that I heard from, from people who had been parts of different CSAs are like, well, I mean, I, I send them $400 in February and then you know, I don't get anything for three months. And then all of a sudden I'm just like inundated in potatoes and onions and I don't know what to, you know, it's like, yeah. really like, I, I don't need 20 pounds of potatoes a week. Um, right. And so I, I just, if anyone's watching, they've tried it and had a bad experience, I'd say, you know, try somewhere else, you know, don't give up if you're really yeah. interested in it. Um, well, I, on that note, I mean, I think the thing to take away is you're not really overgrowing anything on uh, one acre to three quarters of an acre. 
with no. the, with the spread. We had your ingredients, or not your ingredients, your produce list up on the screen. Maybe we could get that up again. But there's a pretty wide variety that I saw at first glance there uh, on the screen. So, yeah, I, mean, I would just challenge anybody to think about this who's thinking of it. You know, try something fresh for the spring, for the summer. Here's the ingredients list. So, yeah. you know, it's all, it's it's nearly impossible to overgrow and over over deliver. You'll over deliver on the value, not over deliver on the <laughs> kale, which you know, nobody wants right. extra kale. Ben, ben right. tried to bring that file weed into this space <laughs> a few years back, and it's like <laughs> get that out of here. Even even deep right. fat frying it, it wasn't good. Um, yeah, I, I, I oh, honestly, I, I'm not a fan of kale. I'm really not. <laughs> like, uh, but it's uh, you know, it's it's a healthy. It's yeah. a healthy item. So, and, and some people really, really love it. I, I've had customers that would buy two or three bunches every single week. And I, hey, I'm happy they More found something they like. Cause, uh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, that was my, that was my Seinfeld reference. I'm going to try to slip a Seinfeld reference into each episode from here on out. It's, it's a worthwhile oh, endeavor. I got the vile weed one in there. Yes. From, from when Newman <laughs> tried to <laughs> eat that broccoli. Yeah. Oh, that's but, right. Uh, I remember that. Yeah, that was a good show. Good one. Good episode. So what's next? I mean, you you're you're farming this one acre. Um, uh, mm-hmm. which by the way, farming a, an acre or so or a little less, a little more, you don't have a lot of expense for for tractors and, and things like that. Is it is it largely by hand? It's almost you do? entirely. Yeah. I mean, we had so so I do a lot of like salad greens, and there's something uh called the quick cut greens harvester that is it basically if you were to, so uh, let me put it this way. So the farm is kind of like a one acre garden. It's, um, there are 85 growing beds that are two and a half feet wide by a hundred feet long. And yeah. then there's like 15 to 16 inch pathways in between. And so everything is really tight, uh, like really, really tight. So you pack a ton into that one acre. Yep. Um, the salad greens were able to usually harvest with this quick cut greens harvester that if we were down on our hands and knees cutting by hand, one of the, a, a 100 foot bed would take three people, I don't know, three hours or something like that. Probably. Um, I can do it myself in 15 minutes. Um, oh, well, so that, that helps a lot. Uh, but no, I mean the, the most, uh, mechanical thing I have is a rototiller and I just use that for like the pathways uh to keep mm-hmm. the to keep the grass down. Um and like I have a weed eater, you know, but um that's very low tech. If you had a tractor, then you would have to leave room to turn around and drive around. And yep. so all of a sudden it like say you only have one acre to work with, you've cut ten feet off on one end and ten feet on the other. And I can't remember I had I had figured out just 10 feet on either end of the farm. If I had gotten rid of that to get a tractor in there, I think it was like losing like $4,000 in sales a year or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, or it's an expensive tractor. Right. It's even though in addition to the cost of the tractor itself and the maintenance and all that stuff, it's like you, you grow less. Now, if you have 20 acres to play with, then of course you're going to have a tractor. If you have five acres, you know, you probably have a tractor. Uh, but doing it this way just allows me to keep everything right there. And it's, it's so nice. If you're working with other people, you don't have to run around tracking them down. You know, you just holler at them or, uh, yeah, over there. yeah we were used to use walkie talkies. That was kind of nice. Um, and you know, if, if I want to do like a crop walk in the morning, every Monday morning, the first thing I would do is get there and just walk around and see if any problems have developed over the weekend or something like that. And, take me 15 minutes, you know, to walk and and I can see everything on the farm in that amount of time. And and that's, that's even if the farm itself is completely planted and full. Um, so there's just a huge increase in efficiency and and convenience and makes the the job a little easier. Such a spectrum of farming. I have a cousin, uh, in Saskatchewan who works for a large, large factory farm. He goes to his farm in his khakis and dre- and polo shirt and sits at like a DEFCON 5 command center Gosh. and Scram. all the satellite connected combines and harvesters and equipment <laughs> that go out and drive and are automated and drive like they're driverless combines. 
Mm-hmm. And he sits there and does them and he gets flown all over the world to consult with Case Ferguson. So there's there's that farmer I know, and now there's you mm-hmm. as a farmer that and I know. Me, there's there's times where I would love to be one of those guys. I mean, when it's sure. at, <laughs> at the the little plot that I I rent, uh, the landowner has something like 30 odd acres. And so I have my one little acre and then right next to it is 18 acres that is rented out to a hay farmer. And so mm-hmm. it'll be like the end of August and my back is broken and it's six o'clock at night. I've been there for 12 hours and I'm sweating and I'm just like still got two more hours of work to do. And he just comes breezing in his tractor and mows the entire 18 acres in a matter of like one to two hours. You know, like, and I'm, you know, I've made it like halfway down one of my 100 foot beds the amount of time. And I'm just like, he's got air yeah. conditioning in there and everything, you know, like, what am I doing? What you do is more rewarding for sure. I think so. I mean, I, I, for me, it definitely is. I mean, I, I'm someone who needs like a lot of, uh, I, I can't really do like one thing and, and be content. Like I just get bored very quickly. Mm-hmm. So like having all these different crops and things cycling in and out throughout the year is, is keeps it kind of fresh for me. And I do like just kind of being right down at the ground level, um, kind of cool. getting my hands and feet dirty and, and just being up close with everything. So that, that I, I get a lot of, so very cool. Love it. Yeah. Love it. So for people who want to learn more and connect, I mean, we've had your, uh, website on the screen, but I guess we go to uh, productivepeasant.com is the website. Your social medias we've had on uh, Instagram. You've got you've got an Instagram productive productive peasant farm uh, mm-hmm. company. You've got that. Go to the website. Mm-hmm. You can check out the CSA program, uh, which is a very cool thing to really kind of deposit back into your. Uh, Community. I mean, if you love green space, that's a good program to do it because that means your local farmers are going to be around. Productive peasant being mm-hmm. one of them. You've got the home delivery yep. box program, which is great. I'd imagine that might become a family affair some night. So, um, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, that little sprout Clara makes an appearance when they drop the box <laughs> off or maybe not. I might be speaking out of turn here. Oh, no, um, no, she, I, I, as soon as, uh, as soon as I can get her out there and driving around with me. I mean, I, I love being with her. So the more I get, yeah, more time yeah. I get to spend with her, the happier I am. So, yeah, and cool. she yeah. likes car rides, but she can yeah. be, it can be one of those days where you can never understand how to calm her down. And then as soon as you put her in a car seat, just go for a little drive. She's go make a out. produce box delivery with that. And all, all those right with the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. Well, uh, we've enjoyed having you here on the, sh- on the show. Uh, productive I've being peasant, here. yeah. Productivepeasant dot com is the place to go and connect with the farm. Connect with Jason. You're watching, hearing the person growing your produce, mm-hmm. which is always nice. Yeah, uh, to know if you really want uh, that kind of an experience with your food, more flavorful food than great tasting produce and food. So, Jason, thank we'll you for taking the time. You get too. That's right. That's true. Yeah, um, cause uh, we were able to work one on one. So, but Jeff, Ben, thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Uh, very, very much. And I appreciate you, uh, taking an episode to celebrate National Agriculture Day and, and, you know, bringing attention to the local agricultural scene. Yeah. Yeah. One last question for you. We'll kind of, uh, uh, shorten our connection cocktail moment, but I think we'd be remiss to not ask how you're celebrating yourself National Agriculture Day. Which is National tomorrow, Agri- tomorrow, we are driving up to New York to bring uh, Clara to meet her, meet my parents for the first time. Mm, okay. So Very we're going to go up there for, go up there for a few days. And because there's going to be cold weather here, there's not much Nothing for me to do, do this coming week. So yep. I'm just going to have a, a nice little break for the rest of the week and uh, yeah, make the most of it with family. That's cool. Very safe drives, safe travels. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you again for joining us, Jason. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have Thank a great you. day. You Thank do you. the same. Well, there you go. That was a really good insight into some food in your backyard. The 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 fertilizer thing blew me away. I mean, it makes sense. You have different crops and they probably require different things, but That's, yeah, fertilizer is fertilizer, right? Like, I don't know. Any different. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's a whole thing. Yeah, like forty different crops, forty different types of fertilizer. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, that's how you get those carrots. Uh, 
nice orange and the green's a nice shade of green representative of the green you need or want. Juicy tomatoes. Juicy vine ripe tomatoes. I thought the avocado tip was pretty cool too. Like Putting over you, the banana? Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Maybe they could power vehicles with banana, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we might have just i mean we might just be a billionaire soon we might have just solved the world's problem where i took the banana gas on avocados <laughs> is that you're gonna you're gonna see in some fancy cafe you're gonna see that on a menu item and the avocado toast is now two dollars more because it was banana, <laughs> banana gas <laughs> avocados and and <laughs> And you'll have some people say, oh, yeah, I take, yeah, man, I, I just can't eat regular avocado toast. Yeah, it has to be the banana gas avocado. <laughs> that's, yeah, you know, that's pretty good. Anyway, but really cool. I, you know, I like avocados. And I, I, I've become more of a fan of an avocado, yes. And, and of course, you appreciate avocados it? make, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> avocados make guacamole. And that's, yeah, so you're coming to appreciate our avocados for, for what they are. For what they are. <laughs> that's a, I don't know. Story for another day. That's a story for another Lancaster Connects episode, but it's a great one. It it's really good. is a great one. And it relates to produce in a way. Uh, yeah. Fermented produce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. I will give you my sleep better tip. It's a pretty simple one. And so, uh, you know, the reality is you probably have uh, some teenagers at home, if you're listening, maybe not in your home, but maybe in your children's home or appear to you if you're a young Lancaster Connects listener. But, you know, uh, our teenagers today have a, a, a sleeplessness epidemic. They're mm-hmm. underslept, underrested, uh, over grumpy, over hormonal, um, some might say, out of balance, out of whack. Maybe they have an attitude, need an attitude adjustment. And so, Sleep and lack of sleep can be a big part of that. You know, sleep is one of these things. We always look for the magic pills in life. Um, Magic pill to lose weight, magic pill to have more brain focus, all this stuff. And uh, we've got that this natural prescription every night. If we get uh, uh, a good amount of sleep, depending upon your needs, uh, which we talk about in our Sleep Better book, what that can look like, the amount you should allot to sleep. But sleeping well and getting better sleep can help restore those hormonal balances. So if you got a grumpy teenager, give them uh, give them a little dose of getting more sleep. Take that electronic device away in the bedroom mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, just yeah. have them focus on getting some rest. And you won't have to give them pills. You won't have to take them to the doctor as much. They'll be a little more balanced, a little less grumpy. That's my sleep better tip. We'll mail you the book. You can request it at gardenersmattressandmore.com slash sleep dash better. Yeah, that's a great... Great point. Great tip there. I think kids nowadays have so much, they do, I feel like they do so much more, have so much more on their plate than when we were growing up, you know, more organizations to be involved in more sports, more you know, yeah. school functions. I mean, I uh, think it's homework, you it, know, it, they're just kind of overwhelmed. There is more. Our society's given us more, mm-hmm. but there's always the agency to say no. Very true. You know, there's, there's no one making you pick up the phone. Uh, at least not outwardly. Maybe yep. the psychology of it all is there to make you want to pick it up. But mm-hmm. it's also there's also benefit in acknowledging that. So, yep. uh, so yeah. I mean, if you focus on sleep, you'll feel better. Yep. Pretty simple. Got a handwritten testimonial here from Gardner's Mattress of War. This is from Vicky. Couple points from hers. Uh, wow. She mentioned our online quiz and education online. She appreciated the education in the confusing world of modern mattresses. Um, so this is a person that knew there's new beds and wanted to get educated on what they are. And um, she really loves that uh, it's a locally owned business that also has old fashioned. She didn't describe old fashioned style, but she means flippable two sided beds. And um, uh, after her last online purchase, uh, she wanted to buy local. So Uh, She's never going to go back online, she writes here. So um, it sounds like that first mattress that was bought online, sight unseen, didn't work. Mm. So she needed to be educated. She appreciated the fact that we had old, old fashioned, two sided flippable mattresses. And sounds like she's, we've got a customer for life. That's right. I was going to say, beware of the people on the screen telling you what to buy, but we are the people on the screen. 
<laughs> tell you what to buy. Very true, right? I guess I guess it goes like kind of like our uh, our guest today. Source is everything, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Source of your vegetables and produce is is important. Source of your sleep information is important. Source of your mattress buying information is important, and we'd love to be that source for you. So if we can help you with that next mattress purchase, if we can help you wake up happier, sleep better, we'll send you our book. Uh, if you just have a question, we're here. You can call to end where we started. You can call or text us at 717-299-6228, and we'll answer those sleep and mattress-related questions. And may maybe with a little bit of Jason's education, some produce-related mm -hmm. questions, like how best to ripen your avocados with a, just two simple ingredients. That's a great internet-like clickbait title. A, a paper bag and a banana. That's right. Get that banana gas avocado. I wonder what else you can better ripen. <laughs> with gas? With gas. Banana gas. We're doing all the banter yeah. after. Just try random things. Yeah, it's funny. I wonder what happens when I put this thing in a bag of banana. That's funny. I love it. Banana gas. That's a good band name. <laughs> On that note, thank you for tuning in. I love the conversation we have with Jason Stone. Please check out the productivepeasant.com. Great farm here in our community, uh, helping you get great, healthy produce to your table. And he'll deliver it to you. Productivepeasant.com. Go check it out. We'll see you next week on Lancaster Connects. Take care.